Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. I have a guy that I've known for, I guess, about a year and a half, but it seems like a lifetime now. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Stephen Kuhn here. So uh, welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast, Stephen. Finally, it's great to get you on here. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, man. It's yeah. an honor to be here. It's been a while. That, that has, yeah. Um, it's uh, It's been difficult to make those 30, Thursday morning meetings, but I've been trying to hit the Thursday uh, evening meetings the best I can. So good, it, good. it has been a little while. But uh, before we get started, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your your journey. What was your military story? What, you know, catch us up right. to who you are and where you're at today. Right. Well, I uh, I got chaptered out. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, <laughs> I, um, I joined in 86. I was 19. Went to Fort Knox. Uh, did the OSIT. At, at the armor school, um, graduated uh, in the excellence in armor program and got placed into a special unit in in, uh, in Germany called the Canadian Army Trophy Unit CAT. Canadian Army Trophy was a biannual competition of NATO tank gunnery units from all the NATO countries and since 1962 and the Americans had never won it. Well, 1987, we won it. So I'm one of the 16 guys in the history of the United States Army that ever won that trophy, which is, blows my mind. I was my one year mark in the army. I got an ARCOM army commendation medal as a PFC. I was like, this is easy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I don't have to do much. I mean, and um, I was a, I was a tank driver, so it wasn't like I had to shoot or anything. Uh, and then that sort of put me on a path of um, being noticed uh, as, you know, in, in second brigade, third armored division, eighth cavalry uh, in Germany in Gelnhausen. Uh, first, the brigade commander, uh, the new one who came in a couple, I don't know, like a year later, um, asked if there was anyone from cat left. And I was the only one left. And he said, all right, you're my driver. I was like, what? <laughs> so I became the Colonel's driver, which was the worst job I ever had in the army. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it was, it was like, go get my coffee. And I, I literally drove in the morning at 4am before PT up to the mountains to get fresh spring water for his coffee. So, yeah, it was a horrible job, but he was a great guy. Vietnam veteran, full bird colonel, was in for 28 years. One of those crusty old guys that was an E6 before he became an officer, you know? Oh, wow. And, like, just just nasty old guy. He would, like, flip generals off. and It was crazy. Anyway, <laughs> um, it was crazy. And uh, remember, the wall was up then. So we were at the border all the time doing our GDP, general deployment, you know, practices and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then we go to the border and do border patrol for 11th ACR. Uh, 11th Army Recovery Regiment. And so that was all exciting. But then the wall came down. And I witnessed that. And that was incredible to see what's going on, uh, to see, see all that going on and and the 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 celebrations and the, the just the happiness of the people and the very um, liberal East German women <laughs> when the wall came down. Anyway, so as a soldier, you know, we have our excitement. Anyway, so <laughs> and uh, – um, then the war, then the war in Iraq. And since we were the largest, um, uh, armored division in the army at the time, they sent us to Iraq and went to Iraq and, uh, spent six months there, came back. I got a bronze star for desert storm, which, you know, is weird, but it happened. Cause when you compare it to this war or operate, you know, whatever Iraqi freedom, then you're like, mm, okay, you know, it sort of makes you feel sort of like, er, not worthy. Um, and then in 93, I decided to get out and I got out, I got a European out and I stayed in Europe, stayed in Germany, which is where I lived for a few years. And I still have a, my residency there. My main residency is there, but I live in Hungary now. Um, and I've been a civilian here since 1993 and, uh, yeah, just loving it, loving Europe. Oh, it sounds like a blast, especially cause I've, I've heard, other parts of your story and the, the wild adventures and bartending and a few other things that you did. It's, 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 it's kind of crazy, you know? Yeah. Well, I had, well, I owned three bars in a nightclub. Um, you know, got my nose and my eye socket broken by the mafia, I separated retina, broken ribs, elbows, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Um, trying to fight, you know, like the mafia, right? Like you can't take over my bar. I'm a veteran. You can't mess with me. And they're like, Oh really? <laughs> you know? And I was like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. And I, and so, you know, I was like that American cockiness that we have, especially as a soldier getting out of something like that, they beat the crap out of me 
beat that out of me big time. Um, but it was all experiences that brought me to writing a book about, you know, my, the, the Gulf War in German became a bestseller. Um, and that put me on TV for about a year where everybody knew me in Germany. And then I became a newscaster and a news, you know, like a guest news agent or what we call it anchor, uh, every MTV VJ for country music in German, you know, as a guest VJ wearing a leather jacket with tassels. It was embarrassing, but that has got to be the most interesting thing I could possibly ever imagine seeing <laughs> country music in Germany around that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was crazy. yeah. It was crazy. Wow. That's yeah. Yeah. You know, it all makes you shapes who you are. That's, that's the interesting thing about all of our stories. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it all brings us to today, but um, along the, along the lines, uh, I know a few years ago you met your business partner, Lane Ballone. Uh, another great guy. And you guys wrote a book and it's actually behind you. Uh, I would admit, I don't have a physical copy of it, but I listened to the audio book because that's my preferred way. Yeah. Uh, my bookshelf was too full to add any more books to it. So the audio library is easier to expand, <laughs> but it's an awesome book. Um, I tell you what I thought was interesting about it is I think everybody can reflect and they can see some people are humble. Some people aren't, some people are alpha personality. Some people aren't. <laughs> And I think for everybody who could could read it or listen to it, whatever, uh, there's something that they can pull out of it and it gives them something to work on. Uh, it kind of sets the benchmark and gives you something to work on. But tell us a little bit about you guys' book. And uh, yeah, Well, the book is, uh, you know, it all started when I met Lane. He's like, damn, what haven't you done? Like, you know, like I've done all this crazy stuff. Like I worked for Mick Jagger, Olivia Newton-John, Andrea Bocelli, these like famous people, the parliaments and dated the highest royal in Germany, met the entire royal family and like hobnob with them as a complete imposter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm like a grunt. I'm a tanker hanging out with kings and queens. It just didn't make yeah, sense. Probably like, Who's this random American dude sitting over here? Exactly. But because I was random and because I was self, I was, I was self-assured or uh, certain of who I was, they accepted me. It was like, wasn't even a question to this day. They probably also um, really enjoyed, you know, the, the, the stories and connecting yeah. with somebody that's not, you know, floating around in their circles all the time. So exactly who respects and is at their level, not talking up to them or down to them, you know, and well, that's what the book sort of has. So it started because Lane's like, well, how did you like do that? I'm like, what do you mean? I, I just walked up to him and started talking like, yeah, but you had to like know your worth or something. Didn't you have like a process? I'm like, no, I didn't have a process. And maybe I did, but I don't know what it's called. So we're like, we got to get this shit out. So we started doing interviews with uh, uh, um, an interview specialist and just started talking, getting it all out. And it would come, oh, what about that? Oh, what happened? Oh, man, I remember that. Oh, no, no, no. And that's how we came up with the five core models that were in the book. And so the, uh, the book is 100% applied knowledge and experience. It's not theory and it's not knowledge just sitting in my head that I'm just talking about or that Lane's talking about. It's what we've lived and the results of how we lived. And so every one of the five chapters or portions is a story or two with a lesson from that story and then the exact action steps you can take to extract your own personal version of your humble alpha. What that means is it's an operating system. So when you know, when you can articulate your own personal operating system based upon your identity and your purpose, right? Uh, when you can articulate that, you can build upon that because you know your, your power and your strength. So when you're out there doing what you're doing, you're not going to do anything that's, that's going to take away from your power and strength or anything that will uh, allow you not to step into your power and strength. That makes you more powerful wherever you go and you own your presence in life in that point. And that's where that true power of radiance comes from, where you can be alpha on the inside and humble on the outside. You don't need to say a word. Everyone sees it because you are certain of your ability to deploy your genius in any given situation. That's pretty much the book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> because just just listening to it once, uh, my immediate thoughts was, oh, okay, all right. You read it or listen to it once. That's not enough. There's no. some books in this world you can just go through once. This is almost like a workbook slash guide. Like you said, you know, it gives you the actionable steps or like Lane always says, you know, take imperfect action. Like, okay, write it down, plug it in your, in your tasks yep. and start knocking these things out. But just going through it once, like I know personally, I went through this kind of thing right around the same time where I just started voicing my, you know, my thoughts and opinions and different meetings and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm not going to hold back. Yep. I have something to say. It's going to add some value or some insight or spur some conversation. And I'm going to say it. You know, and I don't care if I ruffle some feathers. No. Nope. If it needs to be said, it needs to be said. 
Exactly. It's delivery too. You know, I can deliver the same message, mean, happy, sad, crying, whatever, you know, it's the same message. And yeah, we, we preach imperfect action, creating as you go, co-creating with the world around you. And what that means is don't wait till everything's perfect because it'll never be perfect. Just freaking take action. You have an idea, take action immediately. And that action can be a phone call, can be an email, whatever it is, but just take action. Right. And um, I guess, you know, if you look at the book as a workbook, which it basically ended up being, uh, now it's a course at, at um, um, Forbes School of Business and Technology and Harvard and Stanford are now looking at, are negotiating basically to sign a contract to make this course a part of their bachelor's program, which freaking blows my mind. It's getting, it's getting looked at, put into the British BA system, bachelor system. And in the Middle East, in a executive MBA program, uh, and and this is a book that is an interview book that turned into a workbook, just so we can help people uncover their own operating system based on their identity and purpose, you know. And it's just it's 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 pretty it's pretty amazing because we didn't plan that, we didn't plan the universities, we didn't any any of that stuff, you know. We set the vision of reaching out and helping one billion people change the paradigm of what they think leadership is because it's all about you. It's not about anybody else or the courses you took or none of that stuff. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That can, that can help you. But if you're not certain of your abilities of your mastery, then you're, it's hard to be a leader, full leader. There's leaders that have positions. You, 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 you know, oh, yeah. titles and positions, but people are like, how's this guy a leader? Does he know what the hell he's doing? Kind of thing. And so we, that's sort of where we, that's how we approach this whole process is, you, if you can't lead yourself, and how are you going to lead anybody else? You know, <laughs> that's, a, that's 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 a good one right there. And, and you got a good point of like things just kind of coming out organically because I've seen that, in, like I said, about a year and a half that I've known you, because uh, the book had probably come out a few months before. Um, yeah, I joined the Warrior Council somewhere right about that timeline, but then it went from there, and then saw the reviews, and I know you know a lot of people in our same circle that have that have read it. And, talking about it but then you and lane took a trip to peru and i remember sitting in my living room you guys had posted in the facebook group of like hey we've got this big announcement you know such and such time we're gonna do it i sat there with my whole family i'm like all right everybody sit on the couch like Stephen and lane have some sort of announcement they're on this trip to peru like if they're gonna if they're going to blast something out there that you need to pay attention to this like i'm gonna sit down and watch this so we watched it on i think we watched it on youtube or uh, we watched it on the TV. Maybe I should cast it from my phone, yeah. from Facebook. But you came out with half the humble alpha veteran empowerment, which I am. I, I, I told you before we started recording, I was like, I was looking through my T-shirt drawer today, and I'm like, that's the one. <laughs> that's today. So tell us what what that vision was that you guys came up with. Yeah, well, you know, humble alpha came through the same way. It came the, the name humble alpha came through Peru, our Peru journey as well. The idea for the book came through the Peru journey. Every time we go to Peru, we work with plant medicine, sacred plant medicine. And we expand our consciousness and, and release all blockages and, and um, activate our creativity. So the brain is a, cre a creation organ, right? An organ of creation. It's not a storage vault for, for knowledge. Storage, knowledge not applied is basically just taking up space. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. So, Sitting in a drawer there somewhere. Right. So when we go to Peru, we expand that consciousness so you can let go of the things that you're not, you're not applying and apply the things that you do have that you do need. And anyway, so... I'm sitting there, uh, you know, and, and my intention, when you work with plant medicine, you always have to put an intention. Like my intention is to X, Y, and Z. And this time it was, my intention is to bring together the humble alpha and the veteran empowerment, right? Or the veteran work that we do, veteran, the, the vetpreneur. And I'm sitting there working with the medicine and I got this voice said, write this down. And I wrote it down and it was half. I was like, have? What the heck is have? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and it just crystallized. Humble, alpha, veteran, empowerment. I was like, hey, Wayne, come here. And I showed him. He's like, that's it. All right, man. See ya. Went over and started finishing, and we just finished what we were doing. It was that, it was that, like, non-sensational, right? It was just what it was. It was like, okay, like, the plant medicine delivered, and we're going to go with it. So we sat there, and the next day, we went to the Temple of the Moon, and we sat there and put up the camera and we said, I have no idea what I'm going to say to you. Nope, no idea, but have, it's powerful. We're going to make this happen. And that's when we did the live. We had no idea what we were saying. We had no idea what we were, what we were going to talk about. We just created space and then flowed with it. And that's when we went out with that 
and then what was it like a month later there was the first have mission that we didn't even know was happening and from then it just exploded yeah yeah that was awesome to see um i even told jose i was like man if i could have got down to texas i'd have been down there for that too um for those that aren't aware we, we had a veteran in our in our warrior council that needs some help he had a couple of storage containers he was welding them together to put his coffee shop in and he just needed a little you know extra set of hands and i think it was about six or seven guys ended up going down there and he cooked some food for them and they were there for a day or two hanging out not only building stuff together but i know they sat around the campfire and had conversations and collaborated and i mean that's what it's all about coming yeah. together and, and collaborating well that's what's missing if if, if you know, I've talked to thousands of soldiers and airmen and Marines and Navy and even some Coast Guard. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you can find us. That's like yeah. find a pot of gold in a rainbow. Them, yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that everyone can agree on is when we leave the military, we lose a few things. And one of those is community, you know, and that's not just the veterans, that's the families too. You know, you have commonalities that you're missing now. You have, you know, you live next to a next door neighbor to the post office, the post guy and, and a wife, they have no idea about your military background. But if you live on base with everybody, then you know what I mean? It's like you have that community, you have that place to go. And the other thing is purpose. You know, we, we lose, sort of lose purpose. And so we work hard on that kind of thing, you know, and have is that community. And so these have missions mean a lot. We have the, we're working with the have NFT now. We just launched that. We're doing a recalibrate and relaunch now because of, the difference between Ethereum and Ecta and all these different kinds of cryptos that are causing some blockchain issues. Don't, don't even get me started. Um, but, uh, um, you know, we're not, I'm not worried about it because if the, it's not built on NFT, it's not built on one thing, it's built on the community. And the community has been behind us the entire time. Lane and I preach hit honesty, integrity, transparency, honesty with you, with, with why you do say and think like you do. Uh, transparency is how you step into the world with that honesty. It's your ongoing reputation and the byproduct is integrity. And that's sort of how we live. Um, not sort of, it is how we live to the point of our own detriment sometimes because we're so honest and so transparent uh, with all of our projects and everything we do is when it, when something might not work out the way we said it would, we just say, yeah, it didn't work out the way we said it did. You know, and some people are like, oh, you guys are whatever, whatever. You know, it's that's like- That's a tough pill to swallow to say that too. Oh, not not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I've done I mean, that too many times. Yeah. I've, I, I've, I've not achieved what I thought I would achieve many times, but it's it's a process. Look, your whole life is cascading in front of you. There's no time in, in life you're going to go, I made it. I'm done. Like, this is it. I, I've, I'm actually here. Bullshit. Because the more you learn, the less you know. And the more you create, the more space you have around you to create. And anyone with potential, anyone with capacity, will always be attempting to fill that potential in that capacity. It's just like a goldfish. You're like, what? So it's like a goldfish. A goldfish in a bowl will get, you know, will stay that big. You take that same exact goldfish. If you have a goldfish home, try this. Put it in a big pot of water or put it in a pond, and that thing will grow like up to a foot long sometimes. Because they, they yeah. fill the space they're given. They fill the potential space that they're given. And humans are the same way. And that's why if you're always moving and you're always learning, and you're talking to new people. I talk to three new people every day of the week in weekdays. So three new people every day, at least, sometimes more. And I'm always learning. Oh, my God, that's amazing, amazing. amazing. But I focus on my core talents and my genius, if you want to call it that. Right? And where can I help these people best? Like in the book, you're going to learn a two-word moniker, which is your identity. And mine is powerful connector. Right. So I make money from connecting people, real estate deals, investment deals, um, um, M&A, mergers and acquisitions, uh, you name it, like customers, clients, distributors, manufacturers. And I just make money just connecting people. Right. But I do it in a way where everyone wins, including me, but where everyone wins. I don't just say, oh, you need a client here. Go talk to Joe. No. Does Joe need your services, too? Like, how can we, you know, so I'm, I'm always I'm always putting that power into those connections. And it served me so well. It served me so well that I have a, 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 a good reputation. And so does Lane uh, in everything that we do because we're no nonsense. If we screw up, you know, what's integrity? Doing what you say you're going to do, not doing what you say you're not going to do. And if you screw up, apologize and make it better. Yeah. That's integrity. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that's something we should all, you know, I firmly believe with, you know, lead with first. Well, oh, yeah. and, and you said it, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but it is the first time you have to admit something or the second time or whatever, maybe the third time. But after that, 
it's so liberating not to have to try to like, oh, well, uh, mm, ah. you just, yeah, I screwed up. Yeah. It didn't work out the way we thought. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. We so. failed at something or whatever, but uh, there's learning yeah. lessons, positive yeah. learning lessons. You can learn in right. everything as long as you look at things the, the right way and, and be grateful and, and, you know, take that imperfect action for that next step. Right. There you go. Because <laughs> you don't want to repeat the same mistake twice. <laughs> exactly. And perfect action, no against energy, creating and co-creating as you go. I With, can tell you that. If you want to go a little further, no expectations, right? No expectation of a specific outcome. You have a picture, you have a goal, yes. But how it's going to happen doesn't even matter because when you're certain, that's all that matters. That is a good one. And I'll, I'll tell you what, the, the imperfect action thing for me personally has been absolutely huge. Yeah. It's, I just keep it in my mind, you know this podcast or the other things that I do. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to be the number one podcast in the world overnight, but what can I do today? What can I do yeah. tomorrow? What can I do this week to move the needle just a little bit? Yeah. You know, it's, it's what we should all do business, personal life, whatever. Yeah. The other thing is quality of life, you know, which I know your life. that's, uh, uh, that that's another thing. And it's amazing how simple little quotes like that can just reframe things. And yeah. I know myself, over the last year and a half, I've looked at that of like, okay, what is my quality of life? You know, I was involved in things like my homeowners association. It did not bring me quality of life. No. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm just a couple of months away from finishing up my term and being done and passing those duties off to somebody else. And they keep asking why. And I'm like, quality of life. Yeah. It doesn't bring me anything positive. I get no enjoyment or anything positive out of it. So I'm not going to keep doing it. it. Makes no sense. I think if I look back, I, I came up with that strap line. Before I even met Lane, I think, yeah, before I even met Lane, I used to say it at the end. Of, I still say it at the end of all my videos. It's all about quality of life. You know, <laughs> it's like, like a DJ, <laughs> right? It's the exact same every time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just became our mantra. And quality of life is enjoying life no matter what the task or moment. You know, yeah. and no matter what you're doing, you're enjoying life. And I have to say... You know, it's difficult to be 100%, but it's it's not difficult to be at 90%, right? You know, and, and quality of life is literally you reflecting back like, wait a second, why am I upset? Why am I bitching right now? I'm with my kids. I, it's a weekend or whatever, right? So what? The guy beside me is, you know, driving fast or whatever. He flipped me off or whatever. So what? You know, that, you know what I mean? It's like being conscious of what do I got in front of me here, man? You know what I mean? Like what, what do I, what's my quality of life? That doesn't serve me. See ya. That doesn't serve me. See ya. You know, that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's like you said, it's small little statements, little reminders, because you know, one thing that the reason we wrote the book the way we did, or had it, had it written the way we did as steps and stuff, because it really like, I would read like uh, Napoleon Hill, right? So the Napoleon Hill think and grow rich. I'm reading it and it says tips in there. And then at the end it says, um, remember when we said this, this and that, and you're like, shit, where was that? And you're looking like, Did, I didn't highlight it. Damn. What chapter was that in? You're like, God damn, just give me some steps, man. Like, give me like one to five or something just at the end of the chapter, please. You know? <laughs> yeah. Cause most people aren't that organized. To, yeah. I know. And I'm like, I'm reading the book. I'm not going to stop and write everything down. I'm, I'm in the flow. And then I said, no, I want to have steps in this book. And Lane and I said, yeah, we want to have steps in this book. So everyone could read the chapter, do the steps, get the results, go to the next chapter. And so by the time you're done, you're literally creating your own new foundation of your own operating system based on your, your, your identity and your purpose. It's freaking amazing. If I'm honest. It is. Like I said, I, I just listened all the way through the first time I have yeah. not gone back and done the action steps, but just one read through or listen yeah. through has been impactful to me. And that, that's one of my goals is to go back section by section, like you say, and, and start knocking those out. But, but then all this, um, all this have stuff and the missions all transferred to the NFT space, which I know you've got a discord and there's a lot of people on there and you know, the NFTs have just, just launched uh, and they are a series of challenge coins, which is awesome. And yep. it fits perfect within the, the veteran thing. You went out with the Marines first, which yep. kind of surprised me because you and Lane are both army vets. Well, it was the <laughs> most, it was the most recognizable mascot it was the bulldog. Ah, okay. Gotcha. That so, makes sense. You know, because what do we got? What's the army got? Mule? Yeah, who's going to be like, what? Why is there a mule? Well, that's the army mascot. Oh, you know, <laughs> like most people Good wouldn't point. even know that, you know, right. and because we're also serving partially the crypto community. So it has to be back and forth. And until we educate them on what this is all about, what a challenge coin is, why it's so exciting, why it's a military collectible since the Roman times, 
Um, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a big deal for us. And like I said, we're creating something that doesn't exist. I didn't say it here, but like I've been saying, uh, we we're creating something that doesn't exist yet. It, it, it just doesn't exist yet. We're compiling, basically we're not creating a new wheel. We're using have as an umbrella to consolidate all of the services that are already out there in the veteran healing space and in the veteran transition space. Right. And if you can imagine documenting all this on the blockchain for one central location, whether it's healing modalities and the results or the programs that are out there and the results in one location for everybody, instead of going to Google and finding out veteran service, uh, help me, boom, 350,000 entries. And you're like, oh my God, where do I go? Right? So that's part of it. The second part is, is since the 22 veterans a day who keep committing suicide, and it just happened again yesterday in West Point, dude, un did it again. Someone did it again as, every day. You know, it, it hasn't changed in 20 years, man. 22 veterans a day are killing themselves. Yeah, it's suicide. No, they're killing themselves. All right. I'm not going to yeah. paint, paint a pretty picture. And I know what it's like to have a gun in my mouth. I know what it tastes like. I've done it right back in those days after the war. I know what that feels like. No one deserves that shit. And this is the deal 20 years that's been going on. There's probably 30, 40, 50 times more nonprofits than there were back then. And it doesn't change anything. Why? Fragmentation and competition. There's competition in the ranks. Yeah. We don't need that. So we're like, we're not inventing anything. You keep doing what you're doing. We're just going to bring everybody together and put you in a central place so people can understand who you are. And that's why uh, with our with our uh, project, we're donating up to, with each drop, up to 100 um, veteran nonprofits, 25 per mascot right when we launch and it's a daunting project i gotta tell you it's not easy uh the tech is overwhelming it changes every day um the oh man the the the, the complexity of it all is just just mind-boggling right so it's uh it's it's a learning curve but again you know, you learn this much, you want to know more, you want to know more. It's, it just keeps going. Right. So here we are. It's definitely some interesting stuff. Cause I've, I would consider myself on the NFT and crypto stuff as somebody who has a, a base level of knowledge. Uh, you know, I'm no expert in it. I don't trade in it. It's interesting, but I know that a vast majority of the population is totally lost as to what an NFT is or the blockchain or cryptocurrencies. And it's hard, you know, I would say for those people, if you're that lost, if you're interested, get educated. If not, maybe stick with whatever investments that you were doing before, you know, because it is an investment, but it's not only just an investment for you, it's an investment into, you know, the veteran space yep. and helping those nonprofits because we all know that there's like 45,000, I think, veteran nonprofits in different spaces around the, the nation. And it's, they're all doing things at different levels. And yep. sometimes small levels good, big levels good. You know, doing things on a medium scale is good, but the more we can support them, the more we can hopefully change that number. Um, it, it'd be great to see that number zero, but it's never going to be, unfortunately. No. But if we could get that number well, to be 21 or 20, that'd be great progress. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's daunting to think um, about the fact that, and this just came to me yesterday, is that I've, lost more friends to suicide than I now have friends that are alive. Isn't that crazy? Think about that. That's, 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 that's not crazy. even, that's not, it's not even, you know, understandable in any way. And it's, it's a, it's a real thing. And when people reduce, like some people reduce what we're doing, all oh, you guys are trying to make money from the NFTs and stuff like, no, man, no. You know, Lane and I have financed the last four years of everything we do out of our pocket. You know, the Warrior Council costs 49 bucks a month. That doesn't pay for anything. You know, we have all the everything to go with at the website, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but even our event in Texas, we paid out of pocket for that. You know, everything we did, we paid out of pocket. Why? Because that's our mission. What does that mean? It means we got to work on the side too. We got to do our regular job, which we do the advisory, right? So Lane and I do the, the Humble Alpha Paradigm Advisory Upgrade Program. Paradigm Upgrade Advisory Program, um, and you know, busting our asses for this because we believe it, we believe in it, and we believe that there's a better way, uh, not our way, but everybody else's way. Just adjust it a little bit, maybe a little bit more focused instead of like everyone for themselves. And so that's where this is. That's what this is all about. And so we have to stay focused on the good, 
because people start talking about NFT. Well, when am I going to get a mint and how long is it going to cost? And I don't know. Why is it taking, you know, this price and that price and the, the crypto went up and it went down on the cost, you know, this kind of stuff. You can get focused and lost in that. But we have a mission, we have a vision, and that's what we're going for. And we're looking at the things that people are saying good so that we can build upon those instead of looking at the things that are bad that are distracting us from the good. And it's a, it's a daunting task because the more public you make yourself, the more vulnerable you are, right? Well, we unfortunately, are, in our not, community, yeah, it's easy right? for veterans to point the finger and say, oh, you're doing something wrong. You're, you yeah. know, and it's like, yeah. like you said, you're, you're trying to support eventually 100 nonprofits. You know, this is, this is, you know, this is big, big time support and it goes well, beyond financial, but just the connections of them yeah. being able to co collaborate together. The have missions. I mean, we our, our goal is to have international have missions. We've already got Brits, you know, Aussies and Canadians w ready to roll in the have. They want to roll in half. They want to have their own NFT section and stuff, you know, and they want to do international missions. Can you imagine doing a have mission with um, four Brits, four Americans? Like you have one Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine. From America, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine from the UK, and from from Australia, we send them all to Bali to reforest or, or to help in a situation where uh, there's there's trauma or whatever. You yeah, know? that'd be awesome. Think about that. Think about that. Well, it's not only awesome. What it does is it reeducates the world what the meaning of an army can be, because if you think about it, 18 million veterans in America, just veterans in America, that's an army. If I've ever seen one. Right or sorry, a military force. I want to say armies and upset the marines, but you know, <laughs> or the navy or the air force. That's that's a that's a force to be reckoned with. And if we can send people through the world, helping with you know humanitarian situations or like Haiti and earthquakes and things like that, and we we can do that through financing through ha through the um, uh, through the nonprofits and through NFTs, for instance, and maybe the investment fund when we kick that off, then that's going to change the way people will not only look at uh america and england and australia but at the military community the veterans and let's face it veterans have the issue is when they get out they don't know where to start but when they start oh, yeah. but when they start right one percent of america are veterans something like that right so close one 1.5 one percent are, Amer are are veterans three percent of the entire population of america are entrepreneurs but from that one percent veterans 13 percent are entrepreneurs Think about that. So the proponents is 12 times, you know, whatever it is. No, four times what it is or five times what it is. Uh, entrepreneur in the veteran space as it is a non-veteran. And what's that mean? Creating jobs, right? Pushing the economy, uh, you know, help, help helping their local community, all these things. And it's just not focused on. People use veterans as a um, token of achievement, you know, like, like Under Armour. You know, the only, the only reason Under Armour worked with the Wounded Warrior Project because it was great marketing. I don't want to say they don't care about veterans, but. There's an aspect. Marketing. Yeah. Yeah. There's you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, and we got wrong with that. It gets awareness out there. It's awesome. Wounded Warrior Project, they have a love-hate relationship with most, most of their people. But, uh, I mean, I actually talked to the CEO or texted with the CEO on a cell phone, General, I forget what his name was. But, uh, yeah, you know, and it's. It's, it's people ask me all the time, like, why do you give so much of a shit? And I have to say, you know, because, you know, I, uh, I, you know, when I got out of the military in, in, in Europe, I had a hell of a time. I had like a fight um, every day for like a year, like a fight, fist fight after I got out in Germany. And then I had, a crash and burn, like a breakdown. Then I had the suicide attempt. Then, you know, it's like, it just, it was hell. That's why. And now I'm in a place where I think it's pretty cool. And I just want other people to be there. I want to help other people do that. And yeah, I'm the guy that pushes out, looking for new ideas, making new businesses, getting better, da -da 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 -da, investment, da -da 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 -da. I'm doing, that's what I do. I'm not going to sit and babysit. You know, that's not what I do. Right. I'm not going to sit and go kumbaya and stuff like that. It's just only in Peru. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm moving. Because I'm moving. Right. Right. And then yeah. Lane, Lane's completely different. His energy is more like, hey, let's go. Let's do this. Let's calm and look. And, you know, so I'm the I'm the mover. Right. I'm moving. I'm creating new things and bringing people together and getting investments and funds. Oh, NFT. What an idea. Blah, 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 blah. And Lane 
sort of leans back and looks at all this and brings the people in and, and talks to them and stuff. So some people love me, some people hate me. And it, it's not about me. That's all I keep telling people that. It's like, it's not about me. You can love or hate me. It's not about me. It's what I'm doing. That's all that matters. What you, have a good point of, you have a good point about Lane and, and yourself. Like you guys are like a yin and a yang, I guess you could yeah. say. Like I could see you being the one to energize him and him the one to calm down and let's take a step back. I, I know he was a Green Beret like that, which fits perfect <laughs> with his personality probably. Just sit back, see what's going on, assess the situation. Um, but, uh, yeah, the you know, problem I see in the veteran community is, is the lack of community, but – civilians just look at us and they see the negative stuff. They see the PTSD, the suicide attempts, the, the homelessness problem. They, they see the drug and alcohol abuse and it paints us in a bad picture. Yeah. And it's like, where are the good stories? Where are the people that are going past their traumas and succeeding at high level and impacting their community and giving back? And there's, since I've started this podcast and since I've been in the warrior council, there's a lot of people out there doing it and their stories need to be shared. Which yeah. It gives me energy every time I sit down with somebody and do this podcast because I'm sharing another story. It's an opportunity for a civilian out there to hear the successes and the things going on in our community. Amen. Because bro. we got to change that narrative. Like we are, you know, a, a lot of us come out broken physically, mentally. Like we all have some bumps and bruises, you know. Yeah, we were young and dumb jumping out of the back of five ton trucks and doing other stuff, right? <laughs> you know, we, we we take it hard physically. And in some cases, yeah. mentally, but it doesn't mean that we're bad people. It doesn't mean that we're dangerous and we have to change that narrative. Yeah, exactly. So, well, and, and also, you know, it's, it's, uh, let's say narrative is partially uh, self sort of fulfilling, if you know what I mean. Like, like we do it to ourselves, you know, sometimes like veterans, they, we have that temper. We have whatever it is, the issues we have, the PTSD and stuff like that. And we refuse to get help because what's the one thing we do in the military? What do we learn? Team over everything. We can't do it alone. What's the first thing we do when we get out? I got to do it alone. Can't ask for help, right? Can't have anybody helping me. I do it on my own. And that's where a lot of problems come in because they have no support structures. We usually lose that anything, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the biggest problem. You know, one, definitely one of the biggest problems. I mean, there's other ones, financial, employment personal relationships, physical, mental health, but, but that it, is stems from that. it stems from that. In yeah. my opinion, it stems from that lack of structure. Look, I mean, come on, we're told when to get up, when to do PT, when to eat, when to go to bed, like we're told everything, you know, huh? You know Which what is I mean? interesting that so many veterans get into the entrepreneur space. Uh, we're mission driven, results oriented, work together as a team, but a lot of entrepreneurship is working alone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to, to a certain point. And uh, it's it's interesting trying to figure yeah. out why. But met a lot of great, successful veteran entrepreneurs, that's for sure. Yeah, well, I don't ever um, – I don't think I've ever owned a company on my own. Like I've, I've literally turned around hundreds of companies. I've owned over 20 of my own companies. Um, I don't think I've ever been in on my own. I, I've never done a company on my own now that I think about it. No. That's because a moment me. <laughs> Well, it's because I, I, you, you know, if, yeah, we can be our own hero and do that kind of thing. I mean, but I don't know everything and I don't want to do everything. I want to work in my power, right? I want to be the best at what I do in my power, you know, and Lane does his thing. I do my thing. Sarah does her thing. Who's our other partner. Pat does her thing. Who's our other partner, you know, and we just, we just stay in our zone. And of course we cross over. Sometimes we have to, but when, when I, when I, when I realize that I can make a certain amount of money by myself or make a little bit less, but have half the work, Pfft, guess who's going to do half the work. <laughs> That's a good point. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Why? Call your life. life. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Yep. Yep. So there's, there's a lot of stuff for, for people to unpack there, but I'm going to throw the, uh, the, the website up there, the have dash nft.com. I'll have it in the show notes for everybody who, who listens and watches as well as a few other links where you can reach out to Steven and, and or get book and all that stuff. But yeah. uh, tell us about you know, what's, what exactly is going on with the NFTs, you know um, how they can get it, what they, what they basically, what they gotta, gotta do. Right. Okay. So basically the NFTs are challenge coins, as you said, they're, they're based on the, the, the four military mascots. We call them the veteran bulldog is what we call it. Obviously for obvious you know, trademark reasons and stuff called the veteran bulldog. They're in the shape of a challenge coin. Uh, and that's because it's one of the highest or the biggest military collectibles there is period. 
goes back to the Roman times where the commanders would give it to the Roman soldiers for doing a good job or for completing a battle or whatever. Um, and we took that into the digital space and turned them into NFTs. And these NFTs, when you um, purchase an NFT, they're $400, about, depending on what the crypto is, but they're $400 is what we try to base them on. Uh, when you purchase an NFT, we, we put a percentage of that that goes directly to nonprofits in the, in the military. We also take a percentage of that and we stake it, meaning we're going to invest it so that we can give a return to everyone who holds an NFT, right? So that's the plan. Well, you know, we can't guarantee anything, obviously, because it's the crypto world. They might change the law tomorrow. Like Biden might say, hey, sorry, no more crypto in America, you know? So yeah, there's risk involved. It's, it's an investment, just like yeah, anything else, stock exactly. market, but mutual funds, bonds. But it's not a big investment. And when you realize that what we're doing with this is giving back to the community, we're creating a a more cohesive community. We are, we have the ability to do more live events. We have the ability to do more retreats. If we will, we can, we do uh, the online symposiums, the healing symposiums, uh, do the documentation on the blockchain. That's what this is all for. I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's daunting. Oh, it's, I bet. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. The, the, like I, I, I get, I sometimes get migraines which I haven't had for years because it's just the pure volume of new knowledge, you know, and um, it's hard not to get excited about it. Like, Oh gee, we got to make this happen. Like, no, it's happening as it's happening because you know, in the, in the NFT space, people are like, Oh, it's got to sell out in one day. And you got to blah. Well, what happens to that NFT afterwards? Right? Yeah. It sells in the secondary market. It was up and down, up and down, up and down project. People who made it makes a lot of money. And then everybody else is like, well, I have an NFT. And, okay. I sold it and made some money, but what's the point? Like what, what was that all for? Oh, I have access to a, you know, a community of rich people or whatever, you know, like the one that Justin Bieber bought for $1.8 million or whatever, like digital picture of a monkey or some shit. <laughs> and, and, and it's only because he bought into a community of others who paid $1.5 million for the thing. And now they're all like $1.5 million buddies or whatever. But that's not for the normal person. And we're not treating the, the NFT as its own entity. It's part of what we're doing. It's a way to generate revenue and project support for what we're doing for the veterans and their veteran families. Remember, we go to war, sure. But we leave a wife or a husband and kids and grandma and grandpa and mom and dad behind. That's trauma, too. They need to be served as well. And so that's this, this whole have mission isn't just about veterans. It's the veterans and their families and support structures to go with that. And that, that takes a lot of dedication and, you know, if, if it was that easy to go out and get, all, you know, a, a million dollars to do all this stuff, right, then all these nonprofits would have that, ex that experience. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. But they don't. So we have to find a way without asking for handouts where people, they feel part of the mission, they feel like they're part of a community again, and they are. We have, a, we have a Discord channel. They can join that and join us together and sort of chit chat and have a good. It's awesome. We have Australia. There's a lot there. of stuff on that on that Discord channel. Yeah. But just go to the general chat, right? You have general chat. Yeah. And you have like the Aussies in there, and they're freaking awesome. Two uh, two brother veterans. It's really really cool. And that it's just this community that now you have access to twenty four seven. And I, I got to tell you, I had a guy call me last night. My phone rang. Um, from the half team. I never spoke to him. Didn't know his name or nothing, but he called me on Facebook Messenger, right? And I'm like, hello? And he goes, I, we need to talk. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's never a great way to start. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like uh, did you lose money or something? You know, I was like, anyway, I'm like, okay, what's up? He goes, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I'm, I'm, I don't, I can't, I don't know where to, do, where to go. You know, like he was ready to, he was drunk, right? Chain smoking and drinking. And he not was a good not, combination with, with he was not crying. Family. He was not crying. He was not speaking emotionally. He was empty. And I mean, scary empty. So I talked him off the ledge, you know, and if you want to know, it's been hundreds of veterans that call me that I don't even know that I've never met or spoken to. And they talk to me like they know me. Hey, Steven or Steve. Remember the one guy told me, he says, Steve, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> can we talk? I'm like, sure. And he's like, hey, I know you don't know me, but you know, I see what you do in the veteran space and I feel like you understand me. I'm like, okay, what's up? And he goes, yeah, I'm successful. My business is successful and, and I feel guilty every freaking day because I lost my four team members and I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. It's just too much guilt. I just, I just, I don't want to be here anymore. So you have a successful business guy who wants to, to off himself because he feels survivor's guilt, right? 
And in those moments, you're going to learn it in the book, I create space. Meaning I show up wholly and fully for that person with no pre preconceived notions or cookie cutter solutions. And I'm there with one thing that I control, and that is my intention to help add value by solving problems, right? So that's what I do. And for some reason, it came into my head. I said, look, man, look up. He's like, what? I said, look up. They're up there right now playing either spades or dominoes, looking down at you saying, don't F this up, man. Don't F this up. We're up here, so you could be down there. Yeah, yeah. They left he, it in your hands. Yeah, and he Permission. was like, he was like, his whole face just went, Oof. he's like, oh my God, I never thought of it like that. And then I said, can you see him playing spades? He's like, yeah, I can see those bastards playing spades. It just turned everything around like that. Don't know where it came from. It just came, like I said, creating space because you end up co-creating a solution or an answer that you otherwise alone would never have come up with when you create space with someone across from you or, a, 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 you know, a whole yeah. audience, if you will. And so it touches me every day. You know, it touches me every day and it's, it's just... You know, um, especially now it's tight. It's, it's, it's cl I mean, I'm, I'm in Hungary. It's, it's, it's this morning woke up and the cars were all covered in soot, right? Because the soot from all the bombing and stuff went up in the clouds and then it rained. And then I, wow. the, I was like, what is this? And so I'm living in worse soot. You know what I mean? And it's like, talk about triggering my PTSD. Then I got this call last night from this, well, this veteran who, you know, was wanting to leave this planet. And then, you know, so it's like, it's real every single day. And I've been out since 1993. I'm 54 years old, right? And I still do this every day. Why? Because it was the biggest mission I've ever had besides being a father. But that's obvious, right? The biggest, yeah. most selfless, most unforgiving, you know, sort of situation and mission that I've ever been on. And it will never be matched. And that's fine. I don't, maybe I don't want it to be matched. <laughs> yeah. In a lot of ways, you don't. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it is, you know, it's a small part of your life. It's a very yeah. short window um, of your life, your legacy. Uh, but it does leave a big impact on every single one of us in one way, shape, or form. There was an article in The Economist, like 2002 or something. I read it on an airplane. I ripped it out. I don't know where it is anymore, but it was like 2002. And it was a general in the UK that said, when someone joins the military, like a Marine, right? They join the military where they say, hurrah, devil dog, for the rest of their life. There's an automatic cohesion there when you meet somebody. Army, oh, you were, oh, 19, oh, ah. Automatic cohesion. So it doesn't matter what they do after that. They're still a Marine or an Army or Navy or Air Force, right? If the civilian world understood that concept of esprit de corps, imagine companies, what they could do with their employees. Right? Imagine what kind of a powerhouse they would have with people with that kind of identity, right? Self self discovery of that kind of identity. Uh, have you ever heard someone who worked at Apple leave Apple and work for Samsung and say, "No, I'm still an Appler." You know, yeah, no. exactly. No, you know what I mean. And so, yeah, it's a job. It's a, this. It's an adventure. All this other kind of stuff. Whatever you know, it's not just a job. It's an adventure. Um, that was my the commercial when I was a kid, showing my age because people are like, "What's he talking about?" <laughs> but that was the army commercial. It's not just a job. It's an adventure. Uh, we do more, more. We do more before nine o'clock in the morning than most people do all day. You remember that one? That was a commercial too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Kevin Crawley, the tanker. That's why I went into tanks because Kevin Crawley, the tanker on the TV show commercial. But <laughs> you know, these are all things um, that um, keep us in that loop, I guess you could say, because we wrote a blank check, man. Face it, we we wrote a blank check, and everybody wrote a blank. You don't have to be deployed. My first trauma in the mil in the military it never even hit me until I got out is I was literally in country in Germany for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And there's a deuce and a half that pulls up two and a half ton truck. And on the back, there's a two man generator. Right. And I was wondering why I was called a two man, but anyway, two man generator was obvious because you need two man. Right. And one man's pulling it off and it falls on him and crushes his head right in front of me. Ooh. Blood. And he died instantly, blood everywhere. And everyone just froze like, Ugh! you know, that was my first trauma. So it's not about going to war, right? It's about what did you um, say to yourself and how far uh, uh, did you know you were going when you signed up? You know that you could go to war and you know that you might not come back. Who can say that they did that? Who hasn't done that? Nobody. Who can say they understand that? Who hasn't done that? Nobody. 
And that's why we have that bond. That's why when you give up that much of who you are and you're willing to give everything, you let go of something. It's, it's like Definitely. when you have an air balloon, a hot, you, have a, you have a balloon, air balloon, you have a balloon. It's like this big and it's tight and you blow it up, let the air out. It's stretched. It'll never go back to that normal shape. That's veterans in my opinion. Yeah. I, I remember the first time I went to Iraq and we flew in with the Brits to uh, Camp Buka it was a prison camp. Oh, wow. And uh, I remember sitting there, I was probably in chalk six or seven, something like that. And I remember I'm like, we're flying in the middle of the night. By the time I get on that chopper, anybody on the ground that wants to take shots at us has now had the chance to set up yeah. and we're mid flight. They shooting off flares. Um, those, those Brits were, I mean, they, they didn't fire their weapon. So there must've been not been a serious threat, but we made some evasive maneuvers, fired off some flares. And I'm just thinking 21 years old, like, fuck, yeah. this shit is real. There's no turning back. I gave up. I was like, look, I may not yeah. leave here. I may, I may be leaving this place in a box. And at this point, all I care about is the guys and the gals around me. If they can, if they, as long as they leave, that's cool. Isn't that amazing? You just give up on life. It would, and, you know, but you don't give up on life, but you no. give up on life. Like, you you're like, no, if I die, I die. Sacrifice your life. Sacrifice your life. Yeah. 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 You know, and the same thing happened when, when, when they said, well, you're going to the desert, you're the front line. Um, we're the largest armor division. You're going like you're going and we're the eighth cav task force, eighth cavalry. We're the very front. We're the tip of the spearhead. And uh, only two, two ACRs in front of us with McMaster. He peeled off and we ran right into the Republican Republican guard at the battle of uh, 73 Easting, which is now famous. And before we left, they said, you need to write your will and pack boxes for your, your personal belongings. So in case you don't come back, your family gets it. So I'm like, hmm. wrote the will. That was easy. Then I wrote, then I had four boxes, mom, dad, brother, sister. And of course they were small boxes because I didn't have anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know? Right. And yeah, uh, you don't want to carry too much to the war zone. Like, yeah. No, you no, it's carry... not the war. you leave them behind you. Leave them behind oh, leave them behind. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was just thinking small. like uh, taking the A bags and everything. And no, 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 no. You don't so want to carry too my, much. No, my Sports Illustrated bikini magazine collection for my brother and my, that was my, thoughtful. Crystal, my crystal ashtray and all it's this kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, you know, I bought in Germany and the beer mugs and the steins and all that kind of stuff. And I put them in there. And then I said, I should probably write a letter to each one. Because if they open this, that means I'm dead. So I sat there and I wrote a letter to my brother, twin. My sister is one year older. My mom and my dad, who are separated, they're divorced for a long time. And I had to write them a letter of what I truly, truly wanted to say to them if I wasn't going to come back. That at 23 years old, that was that was me releasing the, the baggage of life so that I could go to war and be okay with not coming back. And that's exactly what it was. Absolutely. And it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, 18 to 25 year olds doing that for the first time when I'd venture to say almost all, all people at that age are still trying to figure out life. Heck, I don't think I figured out life or my. Hell, I'm 54. Life. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I was about 30 when I finally, like, when things kind of clicked and I'm like, I'm cool with being a dad. I'm happy to be a dad. I know the direction, you know, basic direction I'm going in life. I got this vision and mission. It was 30, you know, two years after, two or three years after I got out of the military, when it finally just like clicked in my head of like, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And so at 22, 23, like, you definitely don't know that. No. You know, you're, you're, pretty immature and young, dumb, stupid. <laughs> yeah. And I got a cool uniform and I'm tough and I'm a Marine or I'm an army or I'm whatever. Yeah, I know. It's like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of instrument instrumentalization there, but you know, it is what it is. And you know, the military in America provides work and travel and good pay relatively for a social econ a socioeconomic structure that otherwise may not have the opportunity to do those kind of things. And so see it as good or see it as bad. Yeah, I went to war. Yeah, I lost friends. Um, yeah, I have PTSD and all this kind of stuff. But I, I, I can't, I cannot sit here and say that I would change anything. Absolutely. Yeah. I would, I'm the same way. I mean, I would, it would suck to go through some of that stuff again, but I would yeah. go through it. If, <laughs> you know, like, you, you know, go through it and, and do what you got to do. So anyway, Stephen, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show and, uh, and, and talking was, to us about everything going on. A really good conversation, brother. Like I really appreciate it. it was 
that was really, I never like, again, creating space. Um, it just, you just co-create something new. And that was completely new. I talk on a lot of podcasts, like a hundred a year, probably. And this, it was, I've never had a conversation like that. So thanks. Well, I appreciate that. That's my goal is to, my goal with every episode is to educate, inspire, uh, or point somebody in the, in the direction of resources that will let them see that somebody else has been there, that they're not alone, hence the Battle Buddy podcast, but so yeah. that they can better their life in one one or two or three different categories. Just move yeah. the needle a little bit. That's the goal. So, Amen, brother. I, Amen. I appreciate it, Stephen. Until, until next time we chat, uh, maybe, maybe on, a, on a Thursday morning. I know it won't be tomorrow. <laughs> but I appreciate you being on. My pleasure, brother. Take care.